Hello, I'd like to start this video by quickly fixing a mistake that I made in the last episode, which is that if at any point in the path the guard needs to make an anti-clockwise turn, you'll see that this won't actually work. So once we get to this point, the guard just simply won't rotate. Now, that is because in the guard script, in the turn to face coroutine, the while loop only runs if this delta angle is greater than some small value. But what I forgot is that if the turn is anti-clockwise, then the delta angle is actually going to be negative. So what we want to do is take the absolute value of the delta angle, in other words, just make it always be positive. So we just surround this in a call to mathf.abs for absolute, like so, and now that should work fine. So if I just run this to make sure, we should see that it now rotates anti-clockwise. Great, so with that done, we can move on to the challenge that I set at the end of the last video, which was getting the player controller working. Since we're not going to be dealing with the guard for a little while, I'm just going to go ahead and hide the guard and the path object, and just go ahead and create a cube object called player, and I'll reset the transform on that and just bring it up to 0.5 on the y-axis, so it's resting on the ground. And I'll create a c -sharp script called player, and attach that to the player object, and then open up the player script. So in here, I want a public float to control the move speed, and I'll set that to about, say, 7. And then in the update method, I'm going to create a vector 3 called input direction, and set this equal to a new vector 3 with input.getAxis raw horizontal for the x-axis, zero for the y-axis, and then input.getAxis raw vertical for the z-axis. And then also normalize this since it's a direction. All right, so let's now try using this to calculate our rotation. We've seen how to do this before using the a tan2 function. So I can say float target angle is equal to mathf.atan2 of input direction dot x comma input direction dot z and then multiplying this by that conversion factor of radians to degrees. All right, so if we just say transform dot Euler angles is equal to vector three dot up multiplied by the target angle, then we should be rotating around the y-axis based on the keyboard input. So if I try this out, that seems to be the case. Let me just select the player so we can see the actual arrows. And that does seem to be working fine. So uh, let's now try moving the player with transform.translate along the object's own forward direction, multiplied by the move speed, multiplied by time dot delta time, and relative to space dot world. Now, as it stands, the object will always be moving forward, but we don't actually want it to move if there's no input. So what we can do is create a float called input magnitude, and just set that equal to input direction dot magnitude. So uh, that's essentially the length of this input direction vector. So it will be one if any of the arrow keys are held down and zero otherwise. So if we multiply this, over here by the input magnitude, then if there's no input, it won't move. So let's uh, save this and try it out. So I'll press play, and we can now move around. So that's very nice, but I would like to smooth things out a bit so that uh, the turning and the moving isn't so abrupt. So let's go back into the script. And I'm going to start by getting a smoothed version of the input magnitude. So I'll create a float smooth input magnitude. And then we we'll want a public float called the smooth move time. So I'll set that equal to about 0.1. So that's sort of roughly the amount of time it will take for the smooth input magnitude to catch up with this target input magnitude then the smooth damp uh, method that we're going to be using will need to keep track of the velocity of the smoothing. So we need to create a float called something like smooth move velocity for it to uh, store that value in. And we can then say 
smooth input magnitude is equal to mathf.smooth damp from the current value, so that's the smooth input magnitude, to the target value, which is just the input magnitude, and then it wants a reference to the uh, current smoothing velocity, and so we use the ref keyword so that it can actually modify the value in that variable. And we pass in smooth move velocity, and then the smooth time, which is just our smooth move time. All right, so if we then multiply our uh, move amount here by smooth input magnitude instead of just input magnitude, then if I now play this, we should see that as I move up, there is some smoothing applied. Now, one weird thing that's happening is that when I let go of the keys, the character starts moving upwards because as soon as I let go of the keys, the angle is being reset to zero. So let's actually apply some smoothing to the angle as well, and we'll fix that problem. So I'm going to create a public float called turn speed. I'll set that equal to about eight. And then I'm going to keep track of the current angle in a variable over here. And we'll then say angle is equal to, and I'm going to use the mathf lerp angle method to lerp from the current angle to the target angle with a speed of time dot delta time multiplied by turn speed. All right, so then we just uh, multiply by the angle instead of the target angle. And if we save this, we should see that there's some smoothing applied to the rotation now, but we've still got this problem that when I let go of the keys, it resets the angle to zero. So what we can do is tell it to stop interpolating the angle when the input magnitude is zero. So simplest way to do that would just be to set the speed here to zero when the input magnitude is zero, which we can of course do by just multiplying by the input magnitude. So if we do that and save and play, this should now be working how we want it to. All right, now, of course, currently there isn't any collision detection being applied. So if we create some sort of obstacle, we'll just make a big cube here, like so, and we'll make a new material for obstacles. I'll apply that there, and maybe make that a red color. So if we now move into this obstacle, uh, we just go straight through it. So to fix this, let's go into the player and add a rigid body component. We'll then of course want a reference to that component in our player script. So let's create a rigid body variable here called simply rigid body, I guess. And then in the start method, we can say rigid body. That should be with a small r because it's the name of our variable. Is equal to get component of type rigid body. Now we'll be using this rigid body to set the player's rotation and position so we can actually get rid of these two lines. And remember that rigid bodies need to be updated in the fixed update method. So we'll create void fixed update. And in here we can set our rigid body's rotation just with rigid body dot move rotation. And now it wants a quaternion for the new rotation of the rigid body. So uh, we can say quaternion.euler, which is a method that converts a Euler angle to a quaternion. So our Euler angle is, of course, just vector3.up multiplied by angle. And then we want to set our rigid body's position. So to do that, we're going to need to know the current velocity of the player. So let's go up here and create a vector3 velocity. And at the end of the update method, we can set velocity equal to transform.forward, so that's the direction, multiplied by move speed, multiplied by the smooth input magnitude. So then we say rigidbody.moveposition, and the new position is equal to the old position, so rigidbody.position, plus the velocity multiplied by time dot delta time. All right, so if we save this and press play, we can still move around as before, 
Only now, you can see that we're actually constraining to collisions. All right, so with the player mostly done, I'm going to shift him out of the way quickly and re-enable the guard. And I want to mess around a bit with the spotlight settings. So first of all, I don't want the spotlight to be sort of whited out by the directional light that we have. So I'm just going to turn down the intensity of that a bit. All right, so the main thing that we can see is this spotlight. And I'm going to bring it up a little bit on the y-axis so it's a little bit brighter. And also I'm going to change the shadow type to hard shadows so that the obstacle actually occludes the light. Uh, if we rotate the guard, we can see that working fairly nicely. Uh, it's not super accurate at the moment, but if we turn the bias value down over here, then you can see it uh, is a little bit more accurate. I'm also going to reduce the range to about 13, but one thing we have to be wary of is that the range is 13, but once you actually get 13 units out, the light is very faint, so a player playing the game might sort of misjudge how far the guard can see, which would be a little bit irritating. So we're not going to use this range value as the actual distance that the guard is able to see. We'll use a slightly smaller value, um, but we can use this spot angle here for the guard's view angle. So let's go into the guard script and we get a reference to the spotlight, so just public light spotlight and then also a public float view distance and then a private float called the view angle and we'll set the view angle in the start method just view angle is equal to spotlight dot spot angle alright, I'd just like to have a way to visualize the view distance so we can just draw a line using gizmos so I'm just going to quickly set gizmos.color equal to perhaps color.red and then gizmos, I'll draw a ray from the guard's current position in the direction just of the guard's forward direction and multiply that by the view distance. All right, so let's go into Unity and on the guard we can now apply the spotlight and increase the view distance and you can see this red line being drawn here and I'd say that about at about 10 that's where the light is still very clearly visible so I'll use that as my actual view distance for the moment. Okay so I'd now like to give you the challenge of determining if the guard can see the player and that's based on three factors the first being is the player within the view distance the second being is the player within the view angle and the third being, is the line of sight to the player obstructed by an obstacle? Okay, so I'm going to start out by adding the player tag to the player object, and I'll use this in the guard script to get a reference to the player transform. So I'll create transform player, and then in the start method, I can say player is equal to game object dot find game object with tag passing in player, and then get the transform component of that game object. All right, and I'm going to create a method that returns a bool called can see player. And the first thing I'm going to check is if the distance, so vector3.distance between the guard's position and the player's position is less than the view distance. Now, of course, if you wanted to optimize this a tiny bit, you could compare the square distances instead, since that's a tiny bit faster, but we won't worry about that for now. Uh, so having passed this first check, we want to see if the angle between the guard's forward direction and the direction to the player is within the view angle. So let's say vector3 direction to player is equal to player.position minus transform.position dot normalized and then we can say float angle between guard and player is equal to vector3.angle between the guard's forward direction and the direction to the player. Okay, so that will just return the smallest angle between the two. 
So we can now say if the angle between the guard and the player is less than the view angle over 2, then we've passed the second check, and all that remains is to see if the line of sight to the player is blocked by an obstacle. So to do that, I'm going to cast a ray from the guard's position to the player's position with a mask to pick up only obstacles, and if that ray hits anything, then we know that there's an obstacle in the way. So I'm going to create a layer mask. So public layer mask, I'll just call this the view mask. And then in here, we could use physics.raycast, but it's probably slightly easier to use physics.linecast in this case, which is the same thing, it just allows us to pass in two points to cast the ray between. So we want it to start at transform.position and end at player.position, and we'll pass in the view mask. All right, so if that hits something, then there's obviously something in the way. So I'm going to add a little exclamation mark here to say if we haven't hit anything, in that case, we've passed all three of our checks and we can return true. So we're saying we can see the player, but if any of these fall through, then we're going to return false. Okay, so now in an update method, we can just test this out by saying something like if can see player, then I'll just set the spotlight's color to color.red. And then as soon as the player is no longer visible, I'd like to set the spotlight's color back to its original color. So I'm going to have to save that at the beginning. I'll just create color. Uh, I call this original spotlight color. And in the start method, you can say original spotlight color is equal to spotlight.color and then here we can say spotlight.color is equal to the original spotlight color. All right, let's try this out. So I'm going to have to remember to add a obstacle layer to this obstacle. So let me create that quickly and add that there. And then on the guard, set the view mask to be obstacle. All right, let's try this out. So I'll walk into the field of view and it turns red. And then as soon as I exit, it goes back to yellow. So that does appear to be working as intended. Oops, I fell off the map, but otherwise that's all looking good. Okay, so until next episode, I'll be leaving you with the challenge of designing a small level and making it so that if the player makes it to the end point, then a congratulations screen pops up and if the player is spotted, then a game over screen pops up, with an option to retry the level. I think it might also be nice if, when the guard spots the player, the spotlight turns red over the course of, say, one second, and if the player manages to escape the field of view in that time, then they're still safe, and the spotlight colour turns back to yellow. Alright, until next time, cheers!